I was kidnapped, raped, and held captive for nine months. People still say to me, did you sympathize with your captors? It made me feel so defensive. Everyone thinks they know me. But you have no idea. This guy told her, if you run, I will kill your mother. You don't have a right to question why this girl didn't run away. The truth is, I made my rescue possible. Um, I just watched this. It's incredible, and everyone, you know, set your DVR, set your TiVo. For anyone, watching their story is weird. Um, given the nature of your story, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to see yours on screen? It's pretty terrifying, actually. Um, I, I remember when I was watching that, I just kept thinking, oh, I can just close my laptop. I don't have to watch it. But also knowing that if I close my laptop, I probably wouldn't open it back up. And then thinking, well, I actually have to get on a phone call and talk about this tomorrow, so I should probably finish watching it. It was pretty terrifying, pretty scary. I mean, I, watching it was terrifying. You obviously lived it. Um, most people would shut the door on a traumatic experience like that, but you've, you've chosen to re-expose yourself, write a book, now this series. There's also a Lifetime movie. Um, why do you keep reliving it? Well, what a lot of people don't realize is that what actually happened to me isn't that uncommon. Rape happens all the time. Kidnapping happens all the time. And so often when I'm asked, well, why didn't you run? Why didn't you do something? Why didn't you escape? You were right there. For years, that question bothered me, and I couldn't understand why. And then I realized it was because I wasn't hearing the question. I was hearing an accusation. I was hearing, you should have run. You should have escaped. You didn't try hard enough. It must not have been that bad. And so as I've continued on in my life and in my advocacy, I don't want any other survivor to be asked those same questions, to feel that same way. So I felt like by doing this documentary, by doing this film, that that would hopefully be educating the public on what it is like to go through something that terrifying and that horrific so that when they meet those individuals in their own lives who experience sexual abuse or rape or kidnapping, that they can be there as a support and as a comfort and not question them why they didn't do something. I mean, w thank you for you know telling your story in that way and using your story to help other people. It's really incredible. Um, you start this documentary by saying that you you kind of want to tell the story in your own voice and, and write what was wrong about what was said about you. How do you think that your story was misconstrued or what, what about your story did you want people to hear from your perspective? Well, because I didn't immediately speak out right after I got home. I mean, I was only 15 at the time. I was still a kid. Um, and it took eight years for my case to came, come to court, uh, which at that point, a lot of facts did come out that I'd never spoken out about before. Um, but over those eight years, I mean, there was a lot of things that were said. Um, I've been told that I've had Stockholm Syndrome many times, which I actually never have. And people have always kind of thought, well, it must not have been that bad because you, you seem fine, you seem okay, you're all right, and you haven't spoken out about it or, I don't know, crumpled up in the public's view. And well, no, it actually was pretty awful. It was terrible. It was, it was horrendous. I never want to go through it again. I wouldn't ask, I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy. But it happened. And in addition to this two-part special that you have, there's also a, a movie on, on Lifetime, is that right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, so why, why did you want to have both types of movies happening in tandem? The Lifetime movie is narrativized and this is documentary style. Why did you think that was an important way to tell the story? Well... I think, well, there's a lot of reasons. The documentary style, I mean, that is straight from my own mouth. That's going from, you have the perspectives of the police, you have my perspective, you have my family's perspective. You have so many people who are involved in the case. So you get, you do get a very full picture. Um, however, with the film, that brings this whole sort of different dimension. You really get a feel for how it was in day-to-day -day life. I mean, you're seeing it being played out in front of you. And it's Intense as it is on that screen, that's what it was like in real life. It was that intense. It was that scary. It was that horrific. And, I mean, the documentary is staggering 
and so so good. But I do think that the film does bring sort of that different dimension to my story. Yeah, and the film, I mean, you really you're really in it. You know, you're really experiencing not what you experienced, but seeing kind of a window into what you experienced. Um, what did you think was the hardest aspect to bring to screen and and how did they succeed in doing it? Well, I think it was a very, for me, it was a very fine line in, in showing what happened, making sure it was very clear about the kinds of abuse that went on without being too overly graphic, without scarring viewers for life. And, and especially if families are watching this, um, I, I wanted to be sensitive to that as mm -hmm. well. And so finding that balance, finding where I would be comfortable with and how, showing how much and then making sure that, you know, it was audience friendly mm -hmm. as well. And you, you mentioned also, um, you know, all the different perspectives that we see in the documentary, the police, your family, things that you didn't know were going on because you were, you know, being held captive. Were there things that you learned watching the documentary that you didn't know before that were happening while you were kidnapped? It was so enlightening watching everyone's perspective on on, on what happened on my case, on um, what police thought, how my family felt, um, how different people who, in, I don't want to say interacted with me, but for lack of a better word, interacted with me. It was, it was, it was amazing. Did you know that your family was, you know, pulling out all the stops in this way, doing everything they could to locate you to, did you, in your dreams, were you imagining that to be happening? Well, I knew that my family would look for me, but I had no idea at, at how huge the search really was. I had no idea. I mean, it's, it's, it's really impressive to see the, the thousands of people who came out to, to help look for you. It, I mean, it gives me chills just now thinking about it, but um, it's been 15 years since you were kidnapped. Um, how has the passage of time changed your thinking about your time in captivity? Well, I certainly couldn't do what I do today if I had tried the day after I got home. So I think that period of time in my life for me to be with my family, to go back to school, to go on to college, to experience different parts of life helped me so that I can do what I do today, so that I can speak about what happened to me, so that I can be involved in these kinds of projects um, without it re-traumatizing me or putting me back in a dark place. So it has been very helpful and very needed. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Um, and the other thing, you touched on this a bit, but I'm, sh I'm sure that the question that you get most often is why didn't you run? Why didn't you scream when you were in public with them? Why didn't you make a commotion? But um, I read something you said that was really powerful. You said that threats are, are more powerful than, than chains. Um, that can be hard to understand. And I was just hoping that you could tell us what you meant by that and how that really happens in one's mind. Absolutely. So the day I was kidnapped, I was brought up into the mountains, I was raped, and the next thing that happened was I was chained up. I was physically chained up between two trees, and I could only reach as far to lie down inside the tent and to use the bucket, and that was it. That was as far as I could reach. And from that point moving forward, I mean, I felt, initially, I felt like being chained up was terrible because that eliminated all possibility of escape. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't break metal bolts. I couldn't, I couldn't uncrush them. And that, that for me originally felt like it was the biggest restraining restraint. But as the days passed, every day I was continually told that if I ever ran, if I ever screamed, if I ever did anything, that they would kill me. And if they didn't kill me, they'd kill my family. And maybe the first threat. Yeah, that's scary, but is it true? I didn't know. But day after day, everything they ever threatened me with, they followed through. And no one was ever there to protect me or stop them. So, yes, I believed it when they started telling me that. And so it got so that I could walk down into, into public, be around other people, and not say anything because... I felt like they would kill me. I felt like they would kill my family. No one had ever protected me before. No one had ever stopped them from hurting me before. So why would it be any different now? And in the film also, um, when when you are, you know, 
saved or when the police do come, there's, the police officers describe about 45 minutes of them trying to get you to say, yes, I am Elizabeth Smart, and you're terrified. You won't say it. Is, was that exactly what you're describing, just the strongest version that's, of it? That's exactly, exactly what I was describing. There was an incident earlier on in my kidnapping where I was in the Salt Lake Public Library where my captors were looking at maps because they wanted to take me away uh, for the winter because we probably wouldn't have survived a northern Utah winter living outside. And um, while we were there, we were approached by a police officer and he started to question my captor, my captors. And um, and at that time, I was I was veiled, I was completely covered, and he said, you know, just let me see your face, just let me see your face. And my captor was like, I can't, that's against our religion, I can't let you do that. You know, that would be, that would be violating her if I were to let you do that. And as her father, I can't let you do that. And that fully convinced the police officer that I wasn't who I truly am. And for that moment, it was terrifying to me because as soon as that police officer flashed his badge as he approached us, I remember Wanda Barzi just clamping her hand down on my knee. And it was just like, it was just like I was reliving the whole kidnapping over again. It was like I was reliving all of the rapes all over again. It was like I was reliving being chained up, being forced to drink alcohol, fo forced to smoke, forced to do all the terrible things that I had never done before that I always promised myself I was never going to do. It was like that all over again. And that fear, it just, it made me feel powerless. And, it, and I felt like the best way to protect myself, the only way I knew how to protect myself from those prior months before that moment was by freezing, was by doing exactly as I had been told to do. And that's what I did in that moment. And that's how I felt the same day I was rescued. Um. You also, you have an autobiography that very bravely tells your story as well. And in it, there's, there's a lot of moments that you kind of describe what you were thinking in those times, you know, um, looking, looking around at people and just being like, look at me, you know who I am. Like you've seen my face on the posters before. And um, in the documentary, there's, there's a scene, he, your captors take you to a party, um, you're veiled, but you know, n n normal people are at this party, people who probably could help you and there's a photograph that's taken there and you're standing next to a man who is um, then interviewed in the documentary and he talks about you know, how he wishes he had done something. Um, that really struck me because there probably are people walking among us who are in situations that they don't wanna be in and they don't know how to get out of it. And I, I heard a story once about a flight attendant who rescued um, someone who was being trafficked what are things that we should be looking for as you know, good citizens, signals, signals of distress for people who might be in a situation like what you were in? Certainly looking for anything out of the ordinary. Um, I know you can't, you can't quite generalize all, all things to look for, but um, things that don't seem quite right, things that seem a little bit off, for example, um, if if there's a house in your neighborhood where there's lots of women constantly coming in and out and maybe always being escorted by a man, or maybe maybe you don't see them for a very long time, but there are still lots of people coming to the house. I mean, that's it's hard to say, mm -hmm. um, but that could be a sign of trafficking. Um, if you have a child and your child is normally happy and bubbly and talkative, and all of a sudden there's a major personality shift, that could be a sign of abuse or, or sexual abuse any form of abuse. Um, it's not always like the visible bruises or cuts uh, that are gonna be the things that set your alarms off. Certainly, yes, pay attention to those too. But um, pay attention to how people react to situations. If they don't react in the way that seems normal or the accepted pattern of behavior, then then keep an eye out. And if it seems if it seems questionable, don't hesitate to call the police because what's the worst thing that can happen? Oh, you're wrong? Um, you're a little, you're embarrassed for maybe half a second and then you continue. But what if that person really is in distress? What if they actually do need help? Maybe you just rescued a life. I mean, I, I will forever be grateful to the people who picked up the phone on March 12th of 2003 and called the police that led to my rescue. And that was just because they thought, they saw something that didn't seem right. They saw three people walking up the street. Um, 
you also are the president of the Elizabeth Smart Foundation, um, which does a ton of advo advocacy work, um, helping people who have been victims of abuse, helping children, helping victims of kidnapping who have come back to their old lives. Um, in a very like nuts and bolts way, how do you, you know, bring someone back into society after they've been held captive? I'm not even sure if I'm the right person <laughs> to answer that. Um, I'm sure there are many more qualified people, but speaking from a victim's perspective, I think one of the best things that can be done is to be treated like a normal human being. I mean, certainly you do need support. You absolutely need a support network. You need people there who are gonna help you, who you can turn to, people you can trust. Unfortunately, that's not always family, but now I kind of, I'd say that family doesn't always mean blood. Sometimes family, they're your friends. They're the people that love you. They're the people that are there for you. So go to your family, the people that love you and are there for you. And it's okay. Like, rely on them. Trust them. Lean on them. That's okay. That's, there's, no, there's no right way. There's no one size fits all of, of healing, of moving forward. But I know for me, being treated like I was a normal human being and being able to make choices for myself, that was huge because for the previous nine months, I couldn't even decide when I drank water or when I went to the bathroom. I had to wait for my captors to tell me when I could or to give it to me. And so even just being able to be given the power to make a choice of whether or not I'm going to have Captain Crunch or Chex for breakfast, that was empowering to me. Um, in, in the documentary, you, you talk about the fact that when you returned home, you made a choice not to, not to do therapy. And I wonder, do people question you on that? And how, do you, how did you make that choice for yourself? I absolutely believe in therapy. I, I, think, I think it's wonderful. I do think it serves a purpose. But when I got home, um, almost immediately I was taken to an advocacy center where I was told that if I allowed myself to be interviewed um, by two psychiatrists that they could stand for me in court. And so I said, well, I actually, I was a minor at the time, so my parents said okay, because they felt like that would be in my best interest. And, and obviously, like, you would think that would be in my best interest. But for me, I was interviewed by two middle-aged men and they were very highly respected um, men in their field. But being alone in a room with two middle-aged men, you know, similar to the same age of the man who had just abused me for all those months and who were asking me very detailed questions about what, was happen ha what had happened to me was very traumatizing. I mean, when they said, well, what happened to you? And I said, well, you know, they hurt me, and how did they hurt me? Well, they molested me. Well, what, you know, how did they molest you? Well, they raped me. Well, what does rape mean? I was like, well, they forcibly had sex with me. Well, do you know what sex is? Well, he forcibly stuck his penis in my vagina. I mean, saying those words for me, I was still a very shy young girl, and that was humiliating for me. So that, I know, now I know that, of course, that's not therapy. That was, um you know, they were trying to help so that I wouldn't have to go to trial, but, or I, so I wouldn't have to stand testimony. But for me, that was kind of my first experience with psychiatrists, which immediately just made me think, no, I don't want to talk to anyone about this, not if it's like that. And uh, so that was why I didn't want to talk to anyone about it. And I think I did have therapy. I think my parents were my therapists. I think that music has been a huge part of my life. And I've always felt that what I can't say in words, I can articulate through music. I can play it. And um, I find being outside and horses and being up in the mountains, I find all of that very therapeutic and very healing. It always, whenever I felt like I, I need to step away from things, that's always so refreshing and just relaxing and kind of helps me to put everything into perspective again. So I do feel like I have had um, therapies, just not the traditional therapy. Um, you're a mom now. You have two beautiful children. Um, how has what you've been through affected or not affected the way that you parent? Do you find yourself nervous? <laughs> oh, it definitely affects the way I parent. Um, it's a constant battle. On the one hand, I just want to wrap them up in bubble wrap and hide them away from the world and just 
stay with them all the time and never let anyone near them. But on the other side of things, I know that I need to allow them to experience life so that when they leave home, if that ever happens, <laughs> um, that, that they'll be able to handle what lies ahead of them, that they will be able to make decisions and choices, being prepared as adults. So I do realize I need to let them experience life, but it is a constant battle, and I still don't have the answer. How do you do it? I don't know. <laughs> um, my final question before we take it to the audience is just, I mean, you're doing, the work you're doing is so brave and so important, and I just want to ask what your goals and dreams are for the future. Well, one thing I do have to talk about, because I'm so excited and I'm so proud of it, one of our biggest initiatives right now at the Elizabeth Smart Foundation is called Smart Talks. And right now we're going into university and holding universities mm -hmm. and holding forums where we have very frank, open discussions about what rape is, how it affects you, how it affects your body and your mind, what happens afterwards, where you can turn for recourse. Because a couple years ago, I was interviewing two uh, women who both had been raped their freshman year of college, but neither one of them knew what had happened to them was rape. One was a boyfriend, one was a friend. And for years, they had felt some self, some sense of guilt, and somehow they'd brought it upon themselves. And that interview has always stayed with me, and it's always bothered me so much. I think that as human beings, all of us crave acceptance. All of us you know, crave um, being liked and, and wanting to have relationships. And that's normal, and that's natural. And I think of even myself leaving home when I was 18 and moving into the dorms, I absolutely wanted to be liked and I wanted to have friends and I wanted to have a boyfriend. And and I I remember thinking, well, okay, like this is okay. This is, I'm gonna be cool because of this or I'm gonna have a friend because of this. How far do you allow that to go before it starts to hurt you? And I think it's really important that we put a name to what's happening and that's that's rape. That's what it is. Doesn't matter if it's a stranger. Doesn't matter if it's someone you know. Doesn't matter if you're taken out of your bed as a 14-year-old girl at knife point into the mountains behind your home. And it doesn't matter if you're walking down the street naked, completely drunk. Rape is rape, and it's never okay. There's never a circumstance that justifies it. So that's one of the things I'm most excited about that we're doing right now. Um, in my personal life, I mean, I've, I've now been married for six years, and I have two children, and I've got three crazy dogs, <laughs> and life's pretty great. I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. And now the audience. Hi. So you were talking about when people used to ask you, like, did you sympathize and all these questions. What do you say to them now if people ask you these questions? Oh, no. <laughs> I did not sympathize. I did what I did to survive, and every decision I made was with survival in mind. And looking back, do I wish I had been rescued sooner? Absolutely. I mean, who would want to stay stuck in hell a single second longer? No one. Certainly not me. But I don't regret a single decision I made because I'm here. I survived. And had I not made those decisions, maybe I wouldn't be alive. Maybe I'd be dead. I don't know. So I don't regret any decisions I made. And I'm I'm so happy to be alive, and I'm so happy to be here, and no, I never sympathize with my captors. Hi, Elizabeth. My name is Kiara. Um, I just wanted to thank you for being a voice, and um, you're a major inspiration to me. Um, you're the ultimate example of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and uh, I'm, I'm a survivor myself, so it's nice to see, finally see you and meet you. Uh, my question is, you're, you're helping other people with your stories. Does that keep you going, and does it help you heal from your past? Well, thank you for your question, and I think you're pretty awesome for admitting that right here, right now, because I know it's terrifying and scary. Um, it's interesting, because I think quite naturally, I'm probably more of an introvert than I am an extrovert. So it's definitely been a learning curve on pushing myself outside of my comfort zone. But as I, as I do speak, as I do projects like this, and as I move forward in my nonprofit work, meeting survivors and hearing their stories, it does drive me. It does make me want to continue on because this shouldn't be happening. It should never be. It should have never started happening in the first place whenever way back whenever the first form of abuse ever happened. It shouldn't. It's wrong. And so, yes, I absolutely do feel driven to keep on doing what I'm doing. 
We have one more question. Hi, Elizabeth. Uh, so if you could convey a message to your captors today, what would you want to say? Honestly, I have nothing to say to them. They took away nine months of my life, and I refuse to give them any more, even if it's the time that it would take to say anything to them. So nothing. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say that this documentary, two-part documentary, is airing on A&E on November 12th and 13th. And you will also have an Elizabeth Smart questions answered on November 20th at 10 p.m. when you're going to answer viewer questions. Um, so we're looking forward to all of that. And thank you again for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much.